Thank you and uh, good morning from the capital of India. And yes, I do hope someday that either you will come to the capital of India or I shall go to the capital of Ireland either way. Let me first thank the Ireland India Council for having shown me the honor of having invited me to speak to you today. I wish it could have been physical on the 15th of August rather than this recorded, pre-recorded form. But you will appreciate that on the 15th of August there are several commitments here. So unfortunately we have to do this in this particular book. Thanks once again, and as has already been remarked, and as people have said several times, there is a certain commonality in the freedom movements that both Ireland and India went through. This is reflected in the correspondence that at that particular time Indian leaders Nehru, Netaji, Patel used to have their counterparts in Ireland all attempts to fight against what was British colonial policy There was also an Irish Indian Independence League. And in fact, so far as the freedom movement is concerned, some of it was not always nonviolent. And those nonviolent organizations also had links with their counterparts in Ireland. I live in a part of Delhi where five minutes away from my house is a road that's named Iman de Valera Mark. And that name will resonate and ring a chord in several parts of India even now. You mentioned English as a unifying language, as a globalizing language. Perhaps it's important to stress the obvious that had English been left to England, here, here. <laughs> had become a dead language. That English has survived today and is becoming a global language is really because of the ex-colonies, the United States included. At that time, pre-independence, there were several civil servants of Irish origin in India. Several of them. We don't always remember them with a great deal of pride. There were two names in particular who are associated and identified with a terrible massacre that happened in April 19 in Jallianwala Bagh as a result of which Rabindranath Tagore gave up his knighthood. And those names of course are Michael O'Dyer and Reginald Dyer. But then we don't remember them. We don't particularly want to remember them. We do want to remember a sister Nivedika, who we do want to remember are the likes of Annie Besant, who set up the Home Rule League. What we do want to remember is the Irish contribution in the area of schools at that time, you mentioned education. Wikipedia probably, when you picked up some of my bio, Wikipedia probably does say 
that I was born in Shillong, which is now the state of Meghalaya, in the northeastern parts of India. And I studied in a school called St. Peter's. But right next to St. Peter's is what is probably the most famous school and college in Shillong even today, and that's called St. Edmunds, which was set up by Irish missionaries. In Delhi, if one is speaking of, if one is asking people about good schools, you'll hear the name of St. Columbus. And St. Columbus again is a school that was set up by Irish missionaries. So there are these links, the cultural links, the educational links that transcended the colonial policy. The mention has already been made about Ramanar Tagore and Yates. And I'm aware, although I've not been to Dublin, I'm aware that the Tagore statue is there in St. Stephen's Green. But it's not just about Yates. I would venture to suggest that more people, let's say in Delhi, I would venture to suggest that more people in Delhi still read, read George Bernard Shaw, Oscar Wilde and James Joyce than they do in London. We have some idea of how early human migrations took place. But I know a little bit more than that because one thing that's not there in Wikipedia is I actually did an ancestry test which is on the basis of your DNA sample. And the ancestry test, as you probably know, works through the mother's side, not through the father's side. And it's of course probabilistic. It's not deterministic, it's not certain. So there are certain attributes and they are matched against a database of attributes. And if I look at mine, all of our ancestors migrated out of Africa at some point in time. If I look at mine, it floated around in New York for some time. Unlike several others, unlike several other Indians who have done similar tests, for them, out of Africa, through the Middle East, down through Gujarat, into India, mine was slightly different. It floated around in New York for some time, southern parts of Europe and then headed to India much, much later. So obviously there is a history of common human migrations specific to Europe and to the broader Indian region with a common descent, which is probably the reason why Sanskrit and Gaelic come from the same family of languages, which is probably also the reason why you have a certain similarity in words. Which is probably the reason why there is a certain similarity in legends and myths also. Whether it is in comparisons of Ganga with the counterpart, and I hope I am pronouncing it right, Ganu, there are a lot of similarities between legends connected with the descent of Ganga and Ganu. There are a lot of similarities between Indra, the god of thunder, lightning and rain, and again I hope I am pronouncing it right, you, too, whatever is the pronunciation. Some years ago I read a paper by an archaeologist which said that the Kampu horn, the horn, the Kampu horn which is still played in Kerala is very similar to the horns that used to be played in Ireland once upon a time. I have no idea whether you still use horns or not. Yeah. So that's our tradition, that's our legacy, that's the richness of commonality that we share. But today we are specifically here because India is heading towards the celebration. In fact, when this recording is played out, it will be the celebration of the 75th Independence Day. 
India became independent in 1947, soon after that. In 1950, we had the Constitution. And the Constitution provides the enabling framework for the polity and the socio-economic structure that exists in India today. The Indian Constitution is one of the oldest constitutions in the world. And when it was drafted, it borrowed on the constitutions of a whole lot of constitutions in other countries, including the Irish one, and this is a fact that has already been mentioned. Specifically, it seems to me that there are certain elements where I can clearly detect influences of the Irish constitution. One of them is the clear separation of powers between the executive, the legislation, and the judiciary. The second one is the directive principles of state policy. The third one is on the method that is used for electing the president. And the fourth one is the process that we have. We have an upper house, we have a lower house. The Lok Sabha and the Raj Sabha. And the fourth one is the process that we have for nomination to the upper house. There have been other ingredients also because we shared a common tradition. There was common law tradition. There was the influence of the colonial legacy. But nonetheless, these are some elements that I can clearly detect are as elements where the Irish constitution has influenced the determination of the Indian constitution. Before I move on to other things, I should also mention in passing a tragic incident which also unites Ireland and India in some way. And I'm referring, of course, to the Kanishka air crash. It was a tragic incident, but yes, that has also been remembered in Post-independence, the importance of these bilateral links and relationships have been stamped with prime ministerial visits from our side and presidential visits from your side. And as you already said, Prime Minister Narendra Modi visited Ireland in 2015, which provided the trigger for India Day. Once COVID is out of, out of the way, I would suggest that it is time for an Irish presidential visit to take place once again, 2016, like a long, long time ago. I've talked about political freedom, but political freedom is not only about political freedom, it is also about economic freedom. And although there is a lot of, there are a lot of areas where there is a commonality. We must remember that our two countries are at two completely different levels of development. The usual yardstick for making cross-country comparisons is per capita income expressed in US dollars. So we are at a per capita income of about 2,200 US dollars now. 2,200 US dollars. And I'm guessing that your per capita income would be about 95,000 US dollars. And it's important to remember that. That we are at 2,200, you are at 95,000. So therefore the priorities about to be different. The priorities for this government, and when I say this government, I don't mean the government that has been here since 2019. I mean the government that has been here since 2015 because there is a continuity between the two Narendra Modi governments. The priority across both of these governments is to ask the question, why are people People aren't voluntarily poor. Everyone wants to better his or her life. 
If people are poor, they are poor because they lack the requisite physical and social infrastructure to lift themselves out of poverty. And one of the conscious decisions of this government has been to deliver this. In several of Indian villages where despite seven decades having passed since independence, this both physical and social infrastructure did not exist. We have 600,000 villages. In many of these, roads did not exist. Gas connections did not exist. Electricity connections did not exist. There was no railroad connectivity in many parts of India. For example, the northeast, I mentioned the northeast where I happened to be born. Seven decades after independence, many of the states in the northeast did not have a railway network, did not have an airport. Water, toilets, health services. Looking at India, it is often useful to look at it in terms of a rural urban divide. Although there is a continuum, but then in terms of the census, there is a rural urban divide. And many parts of rural India, which means those 600,000 villages, were deprived. And in scheme after scheme, what this government has tried, tried to do since 2014 is to deliver this physical and social infrastructure in geographical parts of India that have been bypassed and marginalized. And so far as subsidies are concerned, because some people must be subsidized, so far as subsidies are concerned, to have direct benefit transfers so that the subsidies do not go through middlemen, but are directly channeled into the bank accounts of India. That one of the reasons COVID has not hit India in the rural areas that badly is because of these welfare provisions delivered in the rural areas. There is an index that is brought out, that was brought out in the economic survey and document that is brought out by the Department of Economic Affairs Minister of Finance. It's called the Basic Necessities. It clearly shows the improvement in access to these inputs over time. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying everything is perfect. I remember when I was a student in England, I should no longer say Britain, I should say England, when I was a student in England. We did not have any compunction about drinking water straight from the tap. In India, normally, one would shudder to think of drinking water from the tap. A, you would not have 24-7 water from the tap. B, even if you have that water 24-7 from the tap, it would not be of the requisite quality. So it is remarkable that a few, that a week ago, a city named Bhubaneshwar in India, became the first city in India to offer 24-7 portable water from the tap. It's a remarkable achievement. It is a remarkable achievement that I think 21 out of Haryana's 22 rural districts have 24-7 water supply now from the tap. Not portable. The target for rural India is to have tap water, portable tap water for rural India to every household by 2020. So that's the background pre-COVID. Pre-COVID, to get over, to get beyond that per capita income level of 2,200 US dollars, you need growth. And growth essentially comes from four sources. Consumption, investment, government expenditure, and net exports. Growth essentially comes from productivity, which means making labor, land, and capital markets more efficient. 
I mentioned the constitution and in terms of the constitution, India has a federal structure, although it's not quite federal in a strict, strict legal sense. So therefore a lot also depends on the states. There are certain areas that are meant for the union government, certain areas meant for the state governments and certain areas that are in the concurrent place. And many of these things that I mentioned, the land markets, the labor markets, less so the capital markets, Making them efficient is contingent on what state governments do. But you come back to what I just said, so, so far as growth is concerned, it has to be consumption, investment, government expenditure, and exports. Exports are partly, not entirely, a function of what is going on in the world, the global economy. And even before the global economic environment, the world economic environment was not that conducive to growth, not as much as it was in the 70s and in the 80s even. The WTO was not functioning the way it was supposed to function. The world was being divided into regional blocks. And then COVID hits. If one looks at COVID, and when it looks at India's population, the absolute numbers seem horrendous. But I, was, I would suggest that compared to the dire predictions that were made by models in around March 2020, the number of infections and the number of deaths has been nowhere near those dire predictions. And if you normalize by things like population, you will find even during the second phase, that is 2021, the death rate wasn't that high. Of course, the entire world has been hit by COVID. And some of the effects, if not on mortality and morbidity, will only surface after several decades, perhaps, as was the case with the Spanish flu. But all said and done, India hasn't handled COVID that badly on health grounds. And although the vaccination record could be better, the vaccination record is fairly impressive so far. So even if there is a third phase, I think that third phase, A, it will vary from state to state, and B, even when that third phase happens, I think it will be reflected in infections and not so much in deaths because of the vaccination. That's the health part, but there's the economic. And on the economic part, much of what has happened last year was a function of the lockdown. And obviously, if there is a lockdown, it is going to hit economic activity back. Last year's lockdown was a lockdown that was imposed by the union government. This year's lockdown is much more decentralized. It's determined at the local body. So the shock of this year's lockdown in economic terms has not been that bad. As you probably know, we follow a financial year on the calendar. And this particular financial year, whether you're talking to someone within government or you're talking to someone outside government, the consensus is that this year, real growth, this year means this financial year, 21, 22, real growth will be around 9 to 10 percent, which is pretty impressive. But we must remember that this real growth is happening because of the decline last year. Partly. So the relevant question to ask is what is going to be the real rate of growth, not this year, but from next year. And given a whole range of re 
forms that this government has to pay. I think from next year, not this year, from next year we are talking about real rates of growth of 6% increasing to 7% of their amounts. If I look forward for the next five years, why am I not saying something like 9%? Because I'm not very confident about 9%. For the very simple reason that, as I said, the global economic environment is no longer as benign as it used to be, it is somewhat malign. And COVID has also reinforced protections. So, therefore, I think. Well, 6 to 7 percent real rate of growth is global. 6 to 7 percent may not seem to be very impressive compared to the potential of 9 percent, but because of the exponential nature of growth, growth rates like that also completely change the nature of poverty, the nature of development, the nature of aspirations. They also lead to socio-economic churn because here is a country, here is a democratic country which is going through a very fast rate of growth and many of the western countries included Ireland got where they are today not with such fast rates of growth but with slower rates of growth extended over decades. So the socio-economic impact of that tends to be cushioned and is much lower compared to what happens when you have fast rates of growth in a society. Where does this leave India and Ireland? Some of the sectors have already been mentioned. The commonality of language has already been mentioned. You've also mentioned game theory. By the way, there are plenty of Indians in the area of game theory. Uh, I think the sectors, and you also mentioned 45,000 people of Indian origin in Ireland, I didn't know that, I hadn't realized there were so many. I think the broad areas are very simple to identify. Although any such identification is based on notions of static competitive advantage, and one has absolutely no idea of where market forces uh, take you in terms of dynamic competitive advantage. Offhand, I would say, at a general level of aggregation, the clear area of the services, broadly defined, you want to mention that. Within services, of course, IT and IT related services, educational services, which you also mentioned, and then I need to quickly mention something in case you do not know this. The government of India has come out with a national educational policy which has a roadmap for what is going to happen to education in India by 2030. And in terms of that roadmap, which has to be fleshed out now in terms of implementation, it involves competition and open up. Okay. And of course, I would add the obvious sector in addition to services which of course is pharmaceuticals, but by which I also mean R&D in pharmaceuticals. Those are my initial remarks. Thank you once again for having me back.